Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Larry. How you doing? Very good. How are you? Oh, I'm it's doing good great. Getting better each and every single day. How you doing? Very excellent. Couldn't be better. I, right. I don't know if you can see. I still have a little bit of black eyes in there. I don't know if they're noticeable. Hopefully they're not. Oh, you, you're looking good in the video. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. Where are you uh, calling in from and tuning in from? Actually, I'm in Tallahassee. I'm a... Uh, I'm on a road. I have a small business trip, but I always have my computer with me. So, mm. so yeah, I'm just, I'm in a hotel room. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Yeah, I, I was uh, looking at your uh, impressive resume and uh, uh, I know you did a lot of work with uh, Robert De Niro and uh, yeah. it would have been uh, fascinating for my audience to uh, interview you and Robert De Niro about your fascinating story. Well, that'd be good. Yeah. That'll be enjoyable. Are we on the air now? Uh, we're about to go in uh, one more okay. minute. All right. Well, you let me know. Yeah. You know, that's always a great place to start because uh, when I did my speech at the Mob Museum, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be questions and answers. The night before they told me, oh, no, you're coming up with a speech. So mm -hmm. I started it with that because it's more of a high point and it's, it's more enjoyable to talk about that than the road that got me there. So... Uh, but either way, you're in charge. All righty. Okay. Well, uh, I'll let my audience know that. And uh, we, we got to uh, put that together and uh, make it happen. Because uh, with your story and with Robert's, I know yeah. uh, the audience would be mesmerized. But what y'all two accomplished yeah. together. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. And, you know, don't forget Nick Pelleggi, who wrote Goodfellas and Casino. He's on board. Mm. Uh, I met Armand DeSante. Uh, you know, he was with Denzel and another, uh, an American gangster where they, uh, it was also co-written by Nick Pelleggi. So mm. there's a lot of heavyweights. I was in Martin Scorsese's house. I met Mike Madsen. Uh, and the list is going, it's getting bigger and bigger. Oh, wow. Wow. That, that's, people, uh, yeah. That's absolutely you know, amazing. I got real friendly with my co-hitman in the Irishman, Craig DeFrancia. He, mm. uh, he was in the green book, which was a, you, did you see the green book? I haven't seen that. Oh, you got to see that movie. It was an award winner. It won the, the best picture. Oh, wow. Uh, and it's great, especially now. It, there's a little racial tone to it where, uh, you know, but where the old mob guy was driving around this this doctor who was a who was a black guy. And uh, it's a true story, award winning. It's a must see. Must see. Oh, we, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, please I, I'm watch. definitely going to watch it. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, Craig DeFrancia, he was also in power. Mm. And he's a dear friend now. So, yeah. So it's all good. Everything's going in a great direction. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I know uh, you tell me that um, they actually turned your book, The Life, into uh, a TV series. And y'all going to uh, put it on Netflix platform? Well, it, it, Netflix, HBO, uh, all the heavyweights are going to be approached. Uh, mm. Like I said, with Nick Pelleggi writing it, mm. it's going to be hard for them to turn it down. I mean, everything the guy touches is gold. Uh, he told me, you know, to my face, he says, Larry, you wrote a mob classic. So he's going to enjoy it. He's already enjoying writing uh, with his assistant, JJ. And my producer, Joe Paletto, is very aggressive. He's got some really big ideas uh, about not only that, some other projects. And he's, you know, he's putting his money where his mouth is. He's, uh, uh, you know, we originally thought it might be a movie. But Nick said there's just too much content and detail. And he, he told me he wants to get me six seasons. Wow. So, so I could retire. <laughs> but yeah. So his mouth to God's ears. If he gets even a few seasons, I'll be, you know, ecstatic. So, yes. Yeah. yeah all good. Yeah. Yeah. The Netflix platform. I mean. No, that know, would be fun. Yeah. The movie. Yeah, worldwide. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, As yeah, the yeah, distribution yeah. channels is over 200 countries worldwide. Right, right. So mm. let's let's hope. Let's hope. All righty. Uh, uh, definitely let me know that now. I want to promote it. Oh, that'd be great. I appreciate that. All right. You ready to rock and roll?
Whenever you are, I'm good. Good to go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Arthur Robinson Jr. I'm the creator and host of the Powerful Interviews podcast. And today I have another special interview for each and every one of you. Today I have a wonderful person on the show. And he's a great friend of mine. His name is Larry Mazza. For those that don't know Larry, let me explain to each and every one of you about this incredible, phenomenal man. Larry Mazza is an actor and he is a former member of the Colombo Mafia. His best-selling book, which I love the title, is called The Life. A Brooklyn boy is seduced into the dark world of the mafia. He's been in the hit movie with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, and the movie is called The Irish Men. So that is an awesome, impressive resume. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the one, the only, the powerful Larry Mazza to the show. Wow. What an intro. I, I don't think I deserve all that, but I appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Very nice words. Uh, very, very kind. Well, I'd like to thank you, Larry, here. for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate me and the audience worldwide about your book, The Life, and about the mafia. I gladly appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. Can you explain to the audience in layman's terms for the audience that don't know you, who is the phenomenal Larry Mazza? How long have you been in your powerful industry? How did you get involved with the Colombo Mafia? Well, you know, it's that part of the story is, is really very, very unique because uh, I grew up in a, in a normal childhood. My father was a fireman, a lieutenant in New York Fire Department. My mom, as we got older, worked in a bank. Uh, you know, had everything I needed. I went to Catholic school. I got good grades. I had several jobs as a kid from newspaper delivery boy up to uh, working in a supermarket. Uh, and in that supermarket, I was a little older now. I was delivering groceries in a van. And I met this uh, woman who was quite a bit older than me. She was about 31, 32 years old. I was not even 18. I, I just got my license at 17. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it became a, we, we wound up having an affair together. Uh, a little bit of a seduction, you know, back and forth. And after a little bit of time, I found out that she was married to uh, a heavyweight mob guy named Greg, Greg Scarpa. And uh, his, his nickname is the Grim Reaper. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very powerful, vicious man. Mm -hmm. And here I was at 17, 18, having an affair with his wife. Mm -hmm. But uh, I later learned he had two other wives aside mm -hmm. from her. So he was juggling three different families. Uh, uh, and I always say, I, I think in, in hindsight, I, I made his life easier, you know, because he was 20 something years older than her. He was in his early fifties. She was in her thirties, early thirties. I was 18. Uh, so, it, you know, and, and, and the, the crazy thing is after about a year or so, she started bringing me closer to him. She wanted him to, with his influence, help me in life, maybe get a, you know, a, a, you know, some good businesses and things. And at that point, I started feeling guilty because now I knew him and he was actually doing some things for me. He hired me to be a sales manager of one of his companies. Mm -hmm. uh, got to the point where I was getting paranoid. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in there, she told him about us. Uh, I don't know the details of that. I don't know when she told him exactly, but at some point he confronted me on it. And, you know, he told me that it was okay. He could understand how it happened. He considered me mature for my age and he allowed this affair to go on. But he did tell me if anyone outside the three of us knows him and I would be killed because that's a rule, a Cosa Nostra rule, which I learned later on formally that is a no-no and it can't be condoned by the other bosses in the family. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes sense. It makes every bit of sense. It's a weakness. It's something that, you know, you, you, you can't have. Uh, I learned later on drugs was taboo, but that rule was being broken. I learned that a boss is a boss forever and he can never be knocked out. Uh, and then you see what John Gotti did and what m my boss did. He tried to take over the family and cause the war. So the rules are always broken. That's my point. You know, there's a bunch of rules we're told, but they're broken. Uh, 
But, you know, I did. I got into the life and little by little, uh, Greg groomed me and he educated me the ways to be a, a, a consummate wise guy. I mean, he certainly was the way he dressed, his demeanor, uh, the way he handled the sit down in situations uh, or beefs, as we call them, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and he probably won every sit down we ever went to, you know. So I was really learning from in that context, that life, mm -hmm. uh, the, the perfect guy, I thought. Uh, and then little by little, he brings you into the violent part of it. You know, you, you're not asked to kill somebody the first day or mm -hmm. even beat somebody up. But there's personal things that happen. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, you know, maybe somebody's grandmother was disrespected or mugged or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the boys come and we give the guy a beating. So you think you're doing a good thing. And maybe we were, you know, maybe that little bit of, uh, of influence in the neighborhoods was good. But then, you know, you go a little bit further. This guy owes money. You mm. got to give him a beating. Now it's criminal. Now it's totally criminal. Okay. But you, but it's over. Yes. You get used to it. Uh, I like to tell this part, it's very interesting. The first taste of uh, an actual hit that I was involved in mm -hmm. was Greg asking me to give a guy a flat tire. So he gave me the ice pick. That night, early in the morning, I, I gave the guy a flat tire. The next day's newspaper, man killed fixing flat. So in a way I was involved because I gave him the flat tire and I was watched. He wanted to see how I reacted to that when I saw the newspaper and I knew that I did that for him. And I just never even talked about it. I was silent and I think that was the best approach. He saw that I was able to keep it quiet. I didn't panic. Mm -hmm. I wasn't weak. And you can't show a man like Greg you're weak, especially after you're around him a few years. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm not making excuses. I wound up becoming uh, a, 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 a gangster. And, and, you know, I went through the life. Uh, ultimately, uh, we wound up in a war where, you know, uh, our boss, Junior Persico, got a 135-year sentence. So he was never coming home, obviously. And the person he put in charge, Vic Arena, decided he liked that position and he wanted it officially. He didn't want to be partners with Junior. He didn't want to answer to Junior. And it caused a split. And a vicious, bloody war that lasted probably, you know, the, the actual shooting over a year. But uh, there were bodies and, and things happening for about two years that led up to it. So uh, and then, you know, I made a comment before about my boss that I thought he was the consummate uh, wise guy. Mm -hmm. But the other part of the story that is incredibly unique, uh, but maybe less unique now that we're hearing more and more about it. Mm -hmm. He was a government informer for 30 years. Wow. He was working for the government mm -hmm. and he had carte blanche. And when he got the carte blanche, if you, did you ever see the movie Mississippi Burning? Yes. Okay. There's a part in the movie where the FBI needs help to locate the bodies. Mm -hmm. This is a true story. You could check it out in the New York Times. You could research it. It's all public knowledge now. In the movie, they make it look like the FBI disguised themselves. We really don't know who did it. Mm -hmm. They recruited Greg Scarpa to go down to Mississippi mm -hmm. and do some, the words they used to me was uh, unspeakable things mm -hmm. to get the information. And he went up the ladder. He started with some low-level guys eventually to probably the main guy in the Ku Klux Klan at the time. And he got the bodies. He found the bodies. They owed Greg now. And uh, they paid for the next 30 years. He had carte blanche and could do anything he wanted. So that part is not the consummate wise guy. You're not supposed to be in partners with the FBI, obviously. Mm -hmm. And he was. So that's another part of the story, you know, between how I got in, uh, you know, having the love affair, or the war is an incredible part of the story. And then to find out he was a double agent was, uh, you know, took the heart out of my chest. But it made my decision to retire, get out, make a deal, 
uh, you know, because I had a lot of information on the corruption. Uh, throughout the war, we were getting, uh, you know, phone calls from somebody as to where our enemies were. Mm. Uh, we had a secret code. We had a scanner. And there's a secret code. I'm sorry about this phone. Uh, but we have a secret code. I'll shut it off. And uh, it's a five-digit frequency number. It could pick any number. And we had the exact one that the FBI was using with the, with the New York uh, uh, task force. Mm -hmm. So how would we get that? Obviously, it came from his, his mole. We also got addresses uh, constantly of people we were looking for. And he also told me that he can get information, uh, he can get credentials, like a badge, an ID card, uh, all that type of stuff in case we wanted to address his FBI agents to get one of our uh, enemies. So, you know, there's a lot of deep that. It all comes out in my book. I, you know, I was very, very candid about it. And to get to the other part now, the book was very, very well received by everyone. I mean, almost, you know, the public loved it. Uh, Hollywood loved it. You know, Armand DeSante uh, just wrote an incredible testimonial. If you see, it's on the last page of the book. Uh, uh, Robert De Niro loved it. He told me three times it was a terrific book. And he hired me to be a consultant in The Irishman. Uh, then, yeah, then he did uh, get, cast me in a part. Uh, I played a hitman. And uh, it, it's early on in the movie where they kill Albert Anastasia in the barber seat. So uh, that, was, that was my part. Uh, he then had me go meet Martin Scorsese at his house. And I met Nick Pileggi at his house. And now, ultimately, Nick Pileggi is signed on, is under contract to write uh, what will hopefully be a TV series. That's the best outcome. Uh, but at the very least, it'll be some kind of movie. But we think a TV series because there's just so much content and so many characters to be developed. So uh, that's where I'm at now. And I was in a couple of other things, too. I was in several documentaries. I was in mm -hmm. a TV show called The Perfect Murder. Mm -hmm. And I played a corrupt ex-comp who was a suspect along with uh, a gangster in a murder. And it's a true story. And the gangster, if you remember Casino, Joe Pesci's character. Yes. In, in the 80s, he was my boss, the real uh, uh, Tony Spilatro. Mm. Not Joe Pesci, obviously. And they were they were suspected of that murder. So it, it, it's good. It, it was a, and it was a good part for me. I, I had a lot of lines. Uh, and I, they said I was it, probably the best. I mean, it was incredible. So, I mean, they're great compliments to hear. So I've got a few other things. You know, unfortunately, the COVID thing came around and everything mm -hmm. shut down for so long. Mm -hmm. But I was going to be in a movie with Mike Madsen filmed in Florida, uh, you know, on a yacht. He played a cop. It's still in the works, but I'll get a call soon to go and hopefully film that. So, you know, there's a lot of good things happening now. Uh, uh, you know, when I did the Mom Museum speech, uh, I started it with with the good stuff. I started it with, you know, all the things I'm doing now because it's so optimistic and it's a good story. And then I tell them, that, you know, the road that got me here wasn't uh, is, is nice to talk about. But, you know, it is what it is. And it's true. And, and, uh, and you know, I'm happy where I'm, you know, where I am now. Mm. Now... Gregory Scapa, a.k.a. the Grim Reaper, he's responsible for a lot of murders. Oh, yeah. And basically, you know, he inducted you into that life. What type of personality did Gregory Scapa had at that time? Well, Greg, Greg was very, you know, there was a lawyer that uh, described him on tape once because he had gotten in trouble and he was cooperating. Mm -hmm. And when he was talking about Greg, he said, Greg is good looking. Mm -hmm. charming articulate he could take you to dinner and then for dessert he'll kill you mm. that was a perfect example because you could sit down with him and laugh and have a great time he had a really good personality uh, especially as i got closer to him and i was sort of like his consulier mm -hmm. i could tell him things i could talk to him candidly when we were alone i would never disrespect him in front of people 
But if he was saying something that I disagreed with, I could let him know that if we were alone and he respected that. Uh, he was he was intelligent. He had a great vocabulary, mm. uh, you know, and I think that's it, you know, articulate and, and but very shrewd and very, very. He was always a step ahead, you know, even at the end, like when 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 we were we had to go see the consigliere of the family mm -hmm. when Vic was trying to take over. Mm -hmm. And the consigliere asked him if Vic decides to take over the family, will you back him? And Greg just says, Jimmy, I'm, uh, that was his name. I'm retired. I just got over being very sick, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wherever the chips fall is where I'll go. Mm. Once we got in the car, I asked Greg immediately, how come he didn't declare himself? I know he's a junior person, go loyal, loyalist. And he said he didn't know who Jimmy was speaking on behalf of. If he's speaking for Vic Arena, and he says, no, I'm not going to go against Junior. Vic's going to have to kill him. If he says yes, and Jimmy, who's technically Junior's consigliere, Junior has to kill Greg. So he was stuck in a very bad spot, but he was the most powerful man in the family, the most feared man in the family. So both sides wanted him. But he, he did just get over being sick. It's another part of the story. Greg had uh, developed several ulcers in his stomach and yeah and he had to go in for emergency operations and to stop the bleeding mm. and at one of the operations they left an artery unattached and he was bleeding to death he needed blood desperately so, so he was bleeding internally he was bleeding internally yes in his mm. stomach so the hospital you know this was when AIDS was just first coming around Mm -hmm. and the hospital had blood that was clear. They ran it through, and they knew it was good blood. Mm -hmm. He insisted on having blood from one of his men. So about 30 of us came in, only one match, and the guy that matched was a, a weightlifter. Mm. He used steroids, and he shared a needle. Somewhere along the way, he had contracted the virus. Mm. And his blood matched. So now Greg wound up with the AIDS virus also. Oh. And ultimately that, ultimately that took his life. You know, he lasted a long time. He had enough money to do all the experimental drugs and all the things like that. So he lasted. Uh, he got it, I want to say, in 86 when he was in the hospital, 87. And, so he passed you know, away he lasted, in 1986, right? the Grim Reaper? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, in prison. So, but I'm saying he made it through the war. About mm -hmm. 91, we were all in prison. And then while I was away, I heard he died, like you just said, around 96. I forget the exact year, but probably around then. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, that's another, you know, crazy part of the story. Now, in 1991, uh, another Colombo Mafia war basically, you know, resurrected again. Can you expand right. on that? Yeah, well, what happened... You know, even though even though the uh, the war was ended, there was still a lot of bad feelings, mm. and there was a lot of uh, uh, still a split. Mm. So it you know there was still guys killing each other for 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 control. Even after like we you know like I said, in about eighty nine was where the Cold War started. A few bodies turning up. There was some tension. It was inevitable. Greg told me constantly, it's inevitable. We're going to be in a shoot war. He just saw the way the heads were budding. Mm. So in a, about the year you said, right around 91, it was exploded in a crazy shootout, uh, several shootouts. We were, you know, you know, uh, Greg, myself, and my partner, Jimmy, were involved in at least uh, four hits mm. and several shootouts, injuries. Uh, we got shot at. Uh, you know, there were, there were crazy shootouts. Uh, but then even after we went to prison, there was still a uh, few more murders related to the war. But yeah, but during the war, it was, uh, it was a nightmare. You know, uh, they, they, they tried to kill Greg in, in November, mm -hmm. right before Thanksgiving. And then from there on, uh, we were just, you know, on a, uh, uh, literally hunting 
just driving around every day looking for members of the of the arena faction. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the first guy we got was a guy named uh, Vincent Fusaro. His nickname was Vinny Venus. He owned the Venus Diner. Mm -hmm. And he was part of the hit team that tried to kill Greg. So when we saw him, uh, he was obviously a target. And, you know, it, it was it, it shows you how uh, what's the word, how uh, just uh, treacherous the life can be. The man was hanging Christmas lights. He was hanging a wreath. And, you know, we, we, we shot him. You know, and just, you know, there was mute Christmas music playing, but it was war. I mean, it was a war. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, we had a shootout with Joe Waverly, uh, yeah. who just got back out of prison. Uh, and I hope he goes on with his life and tries to avoid the Colombo family. And maybe he can, uh, you know, live a few good years. Uh, but we, you know, we shot him, his stomach, his behind. I mean, he got hurt real bad. Mm. Uh, but then later on, there was a, 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 a Nikki Black, who uh, my uncle Albert, who was in the uh, Colombo family for many, many years mm. and very well respected, uh, was under Nikki Black. And Nikki told him that if I didn't come over to his side, he was going to kill me. Mm. So needless to say, we made him our next target. And we hung out on his street corner until we found him. Uh, well, I shouldn't even say that because we were so lucky. It was the next day we, mm -hmm. we went to his club and, and there he was. I don't know, you know, what he was thinking, but uh, we pulled up on him and uh, we took him out. Uh, and that one, I, I, I was a little, you know, I can't say uh, it bothered me that much because he just threatened to kill me, you know, and especially in that life, he's a capable shooter and he would have killed me if he had a ch chance and we got him first. Uh, mm -hmm. then, then later on, uh, uh, we got another fellow, Larry Lampese, that was a made guy, uh, that went against Junior, and, uh, we got information on him from, uh, the FBI handler of Greg as to what time he came out of his house in the morning. It was like four in the morning because he had a school bus company that he ran. So he had to get there before all the drivers came in. So we were sitting there three 30, about 20 to four. He comes walking out just like we were told, and we got him. Uh, you know, and in the interim, some of our guys had gotten killed too. There were mm -hmm. two. Uh, they they killed Black Sam, who was a dinosaur. He was about eighty eight. He was harmless. He was sitting in his club. He couldn't even lift a gun. Uh, and they got sloppy. The other side got sloppy. Killing him was a waste of time. They did get Hank. Uh, you know, Hank was uh, had was a very dear friend of ours. And he had this uh, problem where he could just doze off and fall asleep anywhere. Mm. And his, a buddy of his jumped out of the car to make a phone call. He fell asleep, at the, you know, just sitting there. And one of the guys from uh, the other side passed by and jumped out of the car and left him right there. Mm. So, you know, you know, you never know. It was very, it was a violent, vicious, uh, you know, and somebody, you know, and Greg always said, you know, somebody close to us is going to wind up giving us up to get this war over with. Mm. And uh, at that time, it, you know, the only three people that stayed together was him, myself, and my partner, Jimmy. If nobody else could come near us, we were just on our own. And, uh, mm. you know, it was a nightmare. It was really a nightmare to live through. Uh, but, you know, I was lucky enough that at the end of the day, when the feds came in and corralled everybody, mm. and it came out that my boss was uh, uh, an informant, and they were looking for information on that. It gave me an out. It gave me an out. You know, I was fighting my case for a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, have to, uh, you know, uh, I hate to even use the word, uh, become an informant or anything like that, rat, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So my saving grace was that it was one of their own. It was the FBI. And I had information. And a lot of guys beat their case when this all came out. Uh, some guys got their uh, convictions overturned uh, and others were offered deals they can live with. So, mm -hmm. you know, even though I broke a rule and talked to these people, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can look at myself and go on with my life. You know, I didn't uh, go up there and, and expose anything. I didn't point the finger at anybody. Uh, basically, 
uh, the information on the FBI saved my life. Mm. Well, saved the life in prison. Now, I know you got involved uh, with the FBI, and I know at the hierarchy, especially with the Colombo crime family, they basically, you know, exterminate rats. What mm -hmm. do you, from your perspective, what do you consider a rat? And uh, why does the mafia despise rats? Well, well, obviously, uh, they don't they don't ever want to have somebody uh, give them up what they're doing their mm -hmm. criminal acts or whatever. I mean, that's, that's an obvious, mm -hmm. but the problem I have is this, there's a lot more ways of being a rat. There's a lot of ratty things to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I saw it firsthand. My boss working with them all those years. Okay. The boss of the family and his son who mm -hmm. Allie boy, junior, uh, little Allie boy, I should say, who was going to be taken over the family. Mm -hmm told me that him and his father knew about Greg for 20 years. Mm. That's pretty ratty to me. You will, you know, I've seen guys get killed for minor, minor things. Okay. And they allowed this guy to live knowing he was a rat. Mm. Okay. You're not supposed to go against the boss. You're supposed to be loyal to him even before your own family. You take so in a mafia family, you have a boss and an underboss, correct? Yes, in a council year, right. Okay. Well, you're supposed to put that boss ahead of your own family and be loyal to him, okay? It's mm -hmm. a mortal sin to try to take over the family. Mm -hmm. Yet, John Gotti did it. Vic Arena did it. Pretty ratty thing to do. They put you in charge to, to, to run the family while I'm in prison, and then you want to take it away from me? Mm. that's pretty ratty we're not supposed to sell drugs okay mm. i never got involved in that but i saw it all around me and i thought that was a pretty ratty thing to do a pretty ratty business to be in mm. my opinion so you know there's more ways of being a rat guys would take the stand and admit they were good fellas mm. they're ratty mm -hmm. but they got 10 years off their sentence for doing that mm. or you know, when, when I was fighting the case, about five guys came in and, and uh, copped out. They copped the play. But they had to admit there was a war and they were part of this war. That now the judge was convinced it's racketeering because there is a family. They admitted there's a crime family and were fighting for it. None of us admitted that. They had to prove first that there was a family that we were fighting for, a corrupt organization. Until these guys admitted it, they couldn't prove it. How could you prove that? How could you prove that I'm part of some, you know, it, it's, it's, you needed people to admit to it. So we considered them half rats at the time. We weren't supposed to talk to them in prison, but mm. guys talked to them. They went right out the, in, in one ear and out the other. So, you know, I think for me is uh, there's a lot of ways of doing it and it becomes more of a business decision at some point. Like I was facing life. I hear my boss is a, is a, is a witness. I hear that the boss of the family and his son knew about it. I have all these other guys uh, flipping and, and they, there was a line at the prosecutor's door to make deals. They said the Colombo family clogged the system. Mm. So, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's business, it's survival, you know? Mm. And and, you know, I, I'll tell you this, when I was talking to them, my partner, my best friend, because that's another force. Everybody thinks, oh, how'd you tell on your friends? How do you, in the whole family, mm -hmm. okay, thousands of guys, they're not all my friends. It's like any other big organization. If you work for the phone company and there's a thousand workers, not every one of them is your friend. Mm -hmm. So that's a loose word. The only friend I had was Jimmy. I grew up with him through high school, we played ball together. Uh, we did everything together and he stood by me in the war, you know? Mm. And when I was talking to them, I said, the only way I'll do anything is if you keep the door open for Jim, my partner, to come in and get the same deal I'm making. And they told me, no, he's on the lam, he's hiding out, we're gonna catch him. They wanna make an example of him when they catch him. So I walked out like three times. And I says, oh, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Finally, the third day they came in and they says, 
we'll leave the door open for Jimmy. That's mm-hmm. when I said, okay. So that would have been where I was, I would have considered myself a total rat by pointing out my best friend who's hiding out, you know, or, or exposing. I didn't expose anything. I really didn't. My boss told him everything. And the consigliere of the family, Palmer and Sessa, was the second one to flip. He was the highest ranking member on our side of the family. And the day he got arrested, he ratted. He pointed every. He told them about the hits me and Greg did. He told them about the hits Greg Jr. did. He told them about everything. So you got to start you too somewhere. Much information. Yeah, you got to start somewhere, you mm-hmm. know. And I, I said this. I did an interview not long ago, mm-hmm. and I says I'm not in favor of this whole witness protection program thing. I think the government should do their work just like the street detectives do. Go piece together the crimes catch a person, put them away the right way. They started this somewhere and it just opened up the floodgates. So now you can go do crimes and then make a deal. Mm. I'm not for that. I'd mm. rather go back in time. The first guy that did it, whoever the first guy was, was it Joe Valachi? Was it whoever it was? I wish they never gave him that deal. Mm. You know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So now other guys are doing it. Because you opened the door to this. You made it, you made it the American way. Look at Whitey Bulger in Boston. He's another one, like my boss. Mm-hmm. He was working with the government for, for years. He was mm-hmm. able to make a fortune, kill people, you know. So it's almost I hate to say it, but it's the government that made it all possible. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, the government and the mafia, they basically are, you know, two entities. So that's businesses mm-hmm. collaborating with businesses. And um, it's unfortunate and, and they, it's that way, but it is that way. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I interviewed uh, Michael Francis. You know, he was a former mm-hmm. boss of the combo. Yes, he family. was an old family. With his yep. uh, father, Sonny Francis. Yes. And uh, they right. met Michael Francis in the hit movie classic, uh, Goodfellas. Have you ever met uh, Michael Francis? Or his you father? know, I have not. I have not. We are sort of running in the same circles now, and he's hearing a lot about me. I'm hearing a lot about him. At some point in the very near future, we're going to probably do something together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even Sammy, Sammy the Bull, uh, I've been, you know, he's been in contact with me since he got back out. And, uh, you know, we were friends in the street, so we talk again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg Jr., Greg's uh, the Grim Reaper's son, just got released after 33 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a compassionate release. Well deserved because he was doing a lot of time because of his father, you know, uh, not that he was an angel. Mm-hmm. None of us were. Uh, he, you know, we all got had to pay the piper, but 33 years, uh, you know, if, uh, especially in light of them giving his father freedom, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's not very fair. And he did have some serious health issues mm-hmm. that he now has a shot to, you know, to, to survive. You know, he had a lot of cancer in his throat and stuff, but he's home. I saw him. I went and visited him. And, uh, you know, I'm real happy for him. Mm. Now, when Michael Francis came on my program, uh, you know, back in the 80s, they was making like eight to 10 million a week uh, oh, yeah. in, the, in the gas industry. You know, that's huge. Mm. Now, when you, you know, were basically had a connection and uh, y'all develop a friendship, with, you know, Gregory Scapa, a.k.a. the Grim Reaper. Uh, were you generating other multiple flows of income outside of being the hitman at that time? Well, l- let me explain the hitman thing. I really was never considered a hitman, okay? okay. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the life, you're expected at a certain time to be part of hits. And mm-hmm. typically, it's a guy that broke a rule or did something wrong. And he had to pay the price, made a mortal sin. Okay. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't kill for money. Didn't kill for revenge or because somebody hired me. Uh, it was typically because of the life. Mm-hmm. When the war started, uh, I would, I'll give you the leeway or anybody the leeway there to say I was a hitman because it was kill or be killed. Mm-hmm. So you bet your life. I was a hitman because I wasn't going to be hit. You know, so it just, you know, it it grew to that level. Mm. Uh, 
where I made my fortune was in the gambling business. I was very, very good with numbers. Greg saw that at a young age. He brought me into the number business with him. Uh, then I went to the old off-track betting places, and I offered the gamblers a better deal than OTB was giving them. Mm -hmm. I gave them track price. Uh, then they started betting sports with me. So I wound up with a multi-million dollar sports business yearly, you know, mm -hmm. over the over a year, not weekly. Like Mike had that guest thing was incredible. It just, you know, that was way over my head. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we, uh, you know, our number business did 300000 a week, mm -hmm. which typically, which we don't, we don't make that. We will, we'll make anywhere from, you know, uh, 15 to 30% of that depending mm -hmm. on, you know, cause somebody's going to hit the number each week. You know, people are going to win, uh, the sports business, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, I was writing well over a million dollars worth of business. And again, it's, it's both ways. We're not going to make a million, but if you run the business properly, you'll make 20%. So mm -hmm. you're looking at hundreds of thousands on a football weekend. Uh, you know, and I split it up with Greg and Greg Jr. Uh, and later on, I didn't have to give them as much as I became my own man, but I always did. I always still, you know, uh, respected that. Uh, and I was out in the Shylock business where we lend money at big rates, you know, and uh, that was a very, very, that's a very lucrative business. And that was Greg's favorite business. He didn't like the sports because you could lose once in a while uh, where his uh, uh, Shylock business, he just collected. He was making on in Shylock money, probably 30,000 a week, 30,000 a week, just in interest. Mm. And he had, and this is from the 70s to 1990. Never missed a week of making that kind of money. But he also did, you know, he uh, he got a piece of the sports business. He had the number business. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we, whatever there was to do to make money, he did. He had a, we had a guy that made fake credit cards. You know, mm. they weren't counterfeits. They were uh, duplicates. Mm. And. You know, we had about a two year run where we were just shopping and buying things, jewelry, TVs on, on these credit cards. And then we started selling the credit cards to other low level criminals and they would go out and use the credit cards. So that two year run was phenomenal. Uh, you know, if you remember Cabbage Patch Dolls, mm. there was not a Cabbage Patch doll on a shelf at Macy's, but we had a, a warehouse full of them. So we were selling Cabbage, fat, cabbage Patch Dolls. We had... Uh, fake tokens for the bridges and mm. the tunnels uh and it's when they went from 75 cents to a dollar 50. we had a guy that was one penny the copper he melted it down mm. and he he made a token so for one penny we had a dollar 50 token and we were selling them for 75 cents so by a bunch, it, it, they actually went on the news and said they were getting more fake tokens than real tokens so they had to change the whole system. But that lasted a couple of years. Uh, Greg had a key that he can go to the phone booths and open the phone booth and take the change out. He mm -hmm. would ride up and down 95. He'd go down the turnpike. He'd go on the Garden State Expressway. Remember when there were rows of phones before mm -hmm. cell phones and, you know, back in the 80s? Yeah. And he'd open all the phones. They'd come home with bags full of change. I mean, it turned out to be thousands and thousands of dollars daily. Mm. You know, uh, then, you know, we had the video machines, the Joker poker machines. There was nothing he didn't have a piece of, uh, but his most lucrative was the Shylock business. It was just interest on top of interest on top of interest, and nobody ever missed paying him. So that interest just kept compounding over the years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm. Yep. I mean, do the math. 30000 a week for 20 years. You know, mm. and, and on top of other things, and it's one of the biggest mysteries they, you know, they've still called me. I still get calls from agents and cops trying to locate his money mm. because his family is all broke today. It doesn't make sense. You know, they said it's, you know, the, it, it just it doesn't make sense. But what, you know, what I think and my opinion on that is one of two things. As he got older and, you know, and the age started kicking in and the mm -hmm. dementia, he might have forgotten where his safe was or his hide stash was mm. could be buried in his old farm he had a farm out in lakewood it could have been in one of the basements of one of his houses you know under the cement i mean it could be anyway it could be his partner in the fbi might have all that money in a swiss bank account mm. 
you know? That's true. It turns out, yeah, it turns out that's that's the they have no they have no idea where all his money is. And it's got, you know, he once told me, I asked him, you know, alone, kidding around, I said, how much money do you have? Probably laughing, why are you using a fake credit card for dinner? You know, <laughs> it was silly to me. That's how I got my nickname, Legitimate Larry, because I would do that stuff. Mm. And, well, he first he told me, well, the food tastes better when it's free. That was his answer to me. <laughs> so, but I asked him, how much money do you have? Mm. He says, Larry, if I piled my money up and you climbed to the top and jumped off, you'd die. Mm. That's how he could buy his money. So he was a money-making machine. But, but again, he had the freedom to do it. He had the badge. He had the street badge. And he had the law badge. So it made it a lot easier. And he probably wasn't, wasn't putting his dividends in the bank. No, mm. no, no, that's they definitely couldn't do that. But like I said, an offshore account under somebody like an FBI agent, an ex FBI agent, or you know, who well, knows? Account. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Absolutely. Who knows? But it's a yeah, it's it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. Mm. So, wow, let me let, 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 if it's okay, can I mention my website? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's www.marymazza.com dash the life.com my name larry mazza dash the life.com uh and every book gets signed i sign books all morning long i i sign personal uh i i think that's a nice touch especially if it becomes a big hit like the sopranos it would be mm -hmm. almost like a souvenir for somebody but the story i've heard that people can't put it down they finished the book and they re reread it the second time they just had to reread it again. And that's that's really humbling because, uh, you know, in, in college, I was I, I got an A in writing. So mm. I know I can write. I enjoy writing. I've helped my brother, who's, you know, very, very smart school wise. Uh, he's a professional today. Mm. Uh, I've helped him with things. My wife, Kelly, was a vice president in a government contract company. I used to help her write the contracts and help her write the proposals. Mm. Uh, so I knew I could write. Uh, but, but putting the book and putting it in the right order to keep it flowing and to keep it interesting and mm -hmm. not overstep on too many, you know, that's why the, you know, you want the book to go from the, the beginning to the end and flow, but there's mm -hmm. so many people in the book that can be developed in the series, mm -hmm. like Vic Arena, our enemy, you know, I don't write about him till three quarters of the way through the book because I really didn't, nobody knew him until he became the acting boss. Mm. Greg Jr. Greg Jr. is in the book a little bit, but what a colorful, colorful life he had. It, it, you know, he wound up getting into the drug business and close your eyes and think Scarface. That was him. I mean, he was taking over the city and running it. I mean, he wanted every drug dealer in the city to report to him. And there was a lot of violence to get that done uh, so we can develop him. Uh, I'm, you know, there's so many, there's so many other characters in there that can be developed. The, the FBI agent that was, mm. you know, partners with Greg or alleged to be bad or whatever the right word I'm going to use. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be developed. That partnership. Wow. So it is, you know, but even that, I couldn't bring that out. I, I left little hints in the book because I was mm -hmm. seeing things that were weird. You know, mm -hmm. like, how do we get this frequency, you know, to listen to them? Where did he get it? You know? But you can't ask them and you just, all right, we got it. Great. But then at the end, mm -hmm. when it comes out that he is bad and he does have a corrupt agent in his pocket, mm -hmm. you know, but that can be part of the story too. So we'll see, but we're getting there. We're getting there. It should happen. Well, you have a lot of powerful, you know, messages in terms of your life lessons that you went yeah. through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you need to come out with another TV series and put it on Netflix. And I think it should be called The Undercover Message from Gary Scapa and Larry Mazza. I think that'll get a lot of, yeah. you know, national yeah. international attention. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, you know, because I, I'm asked a lot of times at the different speeches or events or book signings, mm -hmm. what would I tell a kid? <laughs> you better believe I tell them, stay clear of that life. Mm -hmm. It's a fraud life. It's a backstabbing life. And it's full of treacherous, treacherous men. And you will become one of them. I became one of them. I, I wasn't born that way, but I learned in the life. Got to be treacherous. You got to be, a, a, you know, you got to be, you, you lie, you backstab. It's, it's a horrible life. Horrible life.
and I'm doing way better now. Even financially, in some ways, I'm doing better now. Mm. You know, I don't get those, 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 you know, those big, big, like I said, those 50, 60, hundred thousand dollar paydays, mm. but I have a gym. I own a gym. Mm. I, I have a bunch of trainers in there and it's good, real money. And I have a bank account and, and, you know, uh, I, I sell my books now. Uh, I get paid for my TV appearances and my shows. So, and it's all real. I don't have to hire Where, Where's your gym located? It's in, in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Well, I received your book called yeah. The Life. Yeah. A Brooklyn boy is seduced into the dark world of the mafia. This is a, a classic. Yeah. Now, Thank do you generate a lot of royalties from your book? Well, here's the funny thing. I did not go through a publisher. Mm. Okay. If Robert De Niro told me that was very smart. Because if I went to a publisher, they get the rights. Mm. They give me some money up front. Don't know how much it would have been. Probably not that much because I'm a first time author. I'm not Grisham. I'm not Stephen King. They get millions up front, you know, because their books are going to sell a million copies. They get a big advance. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I wrote it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my, my mom and dad read it. Uh, I had my sister and brother read it. And every time they found little things and forgot a period, they don't. Even Stephen King has an editor. Ultimately, when I had it done, I hired an editor that was retired from the USA, uh, USA Today newspaper. Mm. So she went through it and very few mistakes at that point, maybe one or two here and there. But she helped me lay it out in the, in the right order and, and name the chapters and do things like that. I had an ex-cop who's a dear friend of mine, uh, Robert Monlandovich. He wrote the forward for me. I didn't want to write the forward because I have to describe myself and I didn't like doing that. So he, he, he wrote the forward for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, like I said, then we, you know, we, we put it in order. So I sell, I, I have a, a local printer mm -hmm. makes me anywhere from, you know, 500 to a thousand copies at a time. Mm -hmm. And I sell them on my website. So it's not a royalty thing. I'm making, you know, uh, if I get, if I buy a thousand books and it costs me $5 and I sell it for 20, I'm making $15 a book being mm -hmm. honest, you know, but you know, if I don't buy, if I buy less, if I only buy 200, I got to pay like $10 for the book. So mm -hmm. it depends, you know, uh, typically after I do a show like yours, mm -hmm. I'll probably order a bunch. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, it's okay to say, uh, you know, you know, I went on another show recently. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, on that show, it, it, I had a big spike in sales. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I, like I said, I'm sure I'll, it'll happen again now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I own it. I own the rights to it. Uh, what I will do is after Nick and my producer have a deal with say Netflix and mm -hmm. it's public, mm -hmm. uh, then I may approach a publisher mm -hmm. because now they have those names Nick Pelleggi attached. Oh, it's based on a TV series. It's going to be very public. Then they'll probably give me a good chunk up front and, right. and uh, I'll let them take over. Then they can take over the sales. It'll be in bookstores. But, uh, you know, I did, and, and, you know, and, and, and I, I'm, you know, I'm proud of myself to get to where I am. I don't know what other word to use because mm -hmm. I did it all by myself. So, but, Absolutely. you know, my wife's helping my family, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm I'm happy with the way it's turned it out. Mm, wow. Now we covered a lot of ground here, you know, with the Grim yep, Reaper yep. and uh, your yep. lifestyle. And um, it's a fascinating life in terms of, you know, yep. what you actually been through. And, uh, you know, you talked about your humble beginnings to where you are today. Can you explain yep. to the audience, what is the best advice that you have ever received? Well, you know, my, my father just passed away. Not too long ago. Oh, oh. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. Uh, he gave me a lot of good advice. Mm. And like a lot of us kids, we don't listen. So I would say listen to your father and your mother. Mm. Wow. And 
they'll guide you the right way. Mm. And I should have done that. Mm. How old was your father? Uh, no, he was uh, about 85. You know, he, he okay. but he, he smoked his whole life and he was a fine. And so he got smoke in his lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, he didn't have a drinking problem, but he wasn't bashful about drinking. I mean, he lived his life, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm very proud of him. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it, it, basically that's, you know, uh, I remember him saying like when the war started, mm -hmm. he told me I should leave. And I told him, I can't leave my friends. I said, this, you know. I said, would you leave your guys in a fire? You know, mm -hmm. and he told me it's not the same. It's not mm -hmm. the same. He was so right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now, you know, how long was your dad a firefighter? 25 years. Wow. Wow. So he was a, he was he, a veteran. Yeah. Yeah. But he got on young. He got on at 21. So he retired at 46. And I was supposed to be a fireman. I was on the test. I was on the list. I was on the list, very high on the list. I got a 99 on the test, 95 on the physical. Uh, but the test ran into some problems and uh, the courts decided to throw it out. I mean, there, it's, there was some affirmative action things going on and uh, uh, women said it was too difficult. The, the, mm. So they had to redo it. And in those years, I went in a different direction. And the, and the, the, the crazy thing is the same judge that ruled on that test Mm -hmm. sentenced to me 15 years later 12 years later wow the same judge mm -hmm. that yeah so it's funny twists and turns and fate mm -hmm. but i'm lucky to be alive too you know those guys, those bullets, those bullets were pinging on my car hitting the walls around me you mm -hmm. know so we were you know uh but but you know i guess a uh, great question listen to the people that are, care for you Mm, absolutely not, not your peers and your friends i don't mean true true friends mm -hmm. but those peers that you grew up with in school mm -hmm. you know uh the peer pressures you know it, it's tough it was very tough in that life you know because you can't you can't be in around a bunch of guys that are giving somebody a beat and you're standing off to the side absolutely you know, so you've got to show you're capable to and you know it's uh it's it's tough. Mm. So yeah. Well, God has uh, blessed you. You know, absolutely. You know, you out of that life, and He's also blessed you. You know, your mother and your father, and uh, yes. your siblings. Uh, in regards to you know moving you forward to a more fruitful yep. life. Absolutely. Now, let's have a conversation about money. Now I know money is mm -hmm. not value. Money is just a facilitator to do transactions. Can you explain to the audience, how would you define money? Well, somebody long time ago said it's the root of all evil. Mm. And there's a lot of truth to that. Okay. Mm. Uh, it's typically the motive for bad things. And, you, you know, you, you need money. You need money to survive, to live, to eat. But it's, it, you know, how much do you need? Do you need an amount that you would go into a greedy area or, 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 or hurt somebody for money. You know, uh, I, I enjoy having money, uh, but I work for it now. I work hard for it. And I, you know, I says it's, it's more real mm -hmm. to me now than it ever was to back then it was paper. You know, I knew I'd have, you know, a, a, and you don't have a value, mm -hmm. but now I value it more. Uh, but I was never a greedy person. Even in the life, I wasn't greedy. I gave away a lot. I still give away a lot. I, I got guys in prison I send money to, uh, you know, to help them through their bedtime. So, you know, uh, but uh, it, it's it, it's nice to have. But there's, you know, I guess 80% of this world mm -hmm. is living paycheck to paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a small percentage of Bill Gates's and guys like that that are mm -hmm. controlling the world now, you know, and all these, you hear about them, big tech, big tech, big tech, you know, they've got the monopolies and they got all the money and, uh, but you need, you need, a, you need what you need, you know, just, uh, if you have 
a, a big family, you got to earn more. So go back to school, get, you know, get a degree, become an accountant, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the, the greed factor, that's always the greedy thing. Mm-hmm. People can't get enough. So, mm-hmm. but that's so a great you, question. So would you say that money is the byproduct of the value that you uncover? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, everybody has a different view on what's enough. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom was very modest. She's comfortable. Mm-hmm. My father was a fireman. Bills were paid. Mm-hmm. You know, she had a, you know, nice watch, nice ring, you know, maybe not a $30,000 Rolex, but, uh, always had nice clothes. We always had a bicycle, you know, we had everything, you know, and like I said, he was, a, he was a Lieutenant. So I think, you know, his, his paychecks would overtime, you, you know, later on, uh, later into the eighties was probably 12 to 1500 with overtime, you know, mm. you're not going to get rich on that, but he supported and put, put us all through schools, private schools. So yeah, you know, he like says, I'm not uh, going to sit here and say, I don't like to have money and I don't work hard. I train as many people as I can. You know, I was training when I came home from prison. I started at six in the morning till 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I trained one after the other. I got a little bit of a break to go pick up my son at school. Mm-hmm. And then at four o'clock, I was back in the gym and I was uh, back into kickboxing and martial arts. So I was teaching classes uh, from four to about eight. Mm. And and I was still training people uh, in those hours. So I was mm. literally working 10, 12 hour days, you know, maybe wow. even more. And then ultimately got my own gym, uh, you know, so I was, uh, I, 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 I was doing well fast. It didn't take me too long when I came home from prison to get back in the swing of earning. So you was but, an implementer. I'm so, so you was an implementer. Yeah, I, I yeah, you could say that. You could say that. I the, the gym I worked for, I did implement some uh, programs that they didn't have mm-hmm. that quadrupled their training program. Mm-hmm. You know, they're charging a little bit less. Train, you know, where, where a person could afford it now, but train two or three people at the same time, and then they became a camaraderie. They looked forward to seeing each other. Three complete strangers would come in and they say, hey, "Where's Jimmy today? Where's uh, uh, Tracy today? Where's Mary today?" you know, uh, for each other. So it became a social thing. They paid a little less, but we made more, you know, and I do that in my gym. So, mm. and I, I took on, I had some really good martial artists, uh, super, super fighters. And uh, they even brought MMA into the, into the mix. Okay. Uh, not that I ever did that. I just learned it with these latest martial arts, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 60 just about. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, really spar anymore. Well, thank you. I don't spar anymore, fight anymore. I just had a, a cartilage fixed in my nose. So you may see a little black and blue under my eyes, but it's about, it's about two weeks old now. So it's just a little lingering effect, but, uh, I had some damaged cartilage. Mm. So. Wow. So. Now, Larry, can you explain to the audience in your own influential way, who was Larry Mazza when you was like, you know, 10, 15 years old? Was you always entrepreneurial or you just developed that mindset over a period of time? Well, I think I was, you know, at at that age, that word is probably a little too strong, but I was uh, uh, ambitious. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I think at 12 years old, I had a newspaper route. Mm-hmm. At 14, I was working in a, uh, as a busboy somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, then as soon as I got my license, I was working in Dan's supermarket. You know, I was delivering and, and working in the supermarket. So I was always working. I was very athletic. I played every sport there is, mm-hmm. uh, including martial arts. Uh, had a bright future, you know, um, in, in, my, in the forward in my book, uh, Robert Melandich mm-hmm. wrote that Larry was born in the light. He had a great future. You know, everything was good. I wound up on the dark side for a while, but came back to the light. And I would say that uh, I was well-liked. All the, You know, I had a lot of friends in the neighborhood. Uh, my friends' parents all liked me. Uh, they liked having me around. I, you know, I think, uh, uh, 
I, you know, to, to a word to use is likable. I don't think I ever had many people that saw me and said, oh, that Larry, I don't like him. You know, I, I, even in school, I was popular with the girls. I had no problem getting dates. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 a, a dear friend of mine, Frankie, who's a, a prominent attorney today, mm -hmm. his words were, if it wasn't for that, he said fortuitous, but then he said, well, not so fortuitous this moment of meeting that girl. Mm -hmm. He would have never been in that life. So yeah. it's just that, you know, that fate, that turn, and then the, the, the fork in the road, you took mm -hmm. the wrong turn, you know? Uh, but he, you know, he described me that way. Uh, mostly uh, Tommy Dades, a cop that I grew up with. His exact words, well, I won't say exact, it may not be verbatim, but he said, if a sweetheart like Larry Mazza could get involved in the things he did, it could happen to anybody. Mm. And I grew up with this wow. guy. He's a highly decorated detective. He's a dear friend to this day, Tommy Dates. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, the same producer that I have, Joe Paletto, mm -hmm. he is also working on uh, the mob cops. And the mob cops was a story about the two corrupt cops out of New York that were killing for the mob. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, the name of the book is Friends of the Family. And the family. it's, yeah, but, the, but, the, but the, the movie that they're working on is called The Mob Cops. Mm -hmm. And they have Terry Winter, who is a fabulous writer, uh, probably uh, the hottest mob writer around right now, even more so than Nick Pelleggi. And he, uh, he spearheaded that case, Tommy Dades. Mm. So, yeah, and he helped me through through this, you know, not in a corrupt way. He, you mm. know, he was very supportive of my whole transition. Mm. So, yeah. Larry, I wrote down some powerful words. So when I mention these words, say what comes to your influential mind. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. Accountability. Accountability. Uh What is the word they use when you have to take, I had to take responsibility, responsibility. That mm -hmm. would be a word, you respond, take responsibility, yes. And, perseverance. Uh, P squared, perseverance and persistence. I use that in my gym a lot. Greg Scapa. I hate to say this, but evil. Hmm. And the reason I hate to say it, because in the recesses of my mind, I do remember some good times. You yeah. know, but uh, at the end of the day, my grandmother called him the devil. Hmm. Larry Mazda. Uh, Back again, I don't want to see, say reborn because that would be, you know, maybe a little hypocritical because uh, uh, although I'm, I believe in God and I'm religious to some extent, I'm not a, uh, you know, uh, like Mike Francesi, I believe became a minister and he's very, very religious now and that's fine. So reborn, I wouldn't say, but back, I'm back. Mm. Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa. Powerful. Mm. Mm. That's what comes to me with Jimmy Hopper. He was very, very powerful. Mm. Richard Kuklinski. Uh Mystery. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the truth about him. I don't know anybody that knows him. So to mm. me, it's a mystery. Sammy the Bull. Oh. Uh. Survivor. Mm. Frank DeMatteo. You know, I, I, I DeMatteo, mm -hmm. I don't know him that well. Uh, I just heard of him. Uh, I would probably put him in the same category as Survivor. Uh, mm. You know, there's a lot of us that are going to fit in that. Uh, but I don't know him that well, so. Robert De Niro. Oh. Oh, 
humble and autistic. I mean, as, as great as he is, he's very, he's very humble, except in his politics. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of that, he's a humble guy. Joe Pecci. Uh, I'm going to say this and I'll explain why. Real. Because mm -hmm. a, a lot of his acting, he's truly that way. Uh, when I was in De Niro's hotel, mm -hmm. there was a little bit of an uproar in one of the other rooms. Mm -hmm. And it was Joe Pesci getting ready to fight somebody. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he was upset with the guy. And mm -hmm. the guy was uh, probably twice his size. So they said, he's very real. He's always, you know, he's not acting that much. He's pretty much a little tough guy. Mm. Yeah. Value. Value. Uh, there, you know, life, value life, value ethics. Mm. Those are the things to value. Family. Al Pacino. Didn't get to meet him, mm -hmm. but I'll say crazy mm. <laughs> yeah just in a in a good way you know what i mean not not mm. not insane crazy just uh and, and based on what i heard he's he's a little he's a little out there mm. yeah. marriage uh you know marriage is is uh you know I, i'm on my second wife so uh i have you know my first wife uh you know we, we went through we went through with me being gone 10 years uh and things weren't the same we have a kid together uh we're still very close my wife now kelly uh we have a phenomenal relationship uh it's a partnership uh she she we help each other in every way uh and uh, you know uh it, it shouldn't be work. I hear people say they got to work at marriage. I don't think that should be the case. Health. First and foremost, I'm very, very, I'm, I, I, I practice what I preach. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. Uh, I will, I, I'll drink, but I will be sure to have days, if not weeks, where I don't drink to give my kidneys and everything a chance to replenish. Uh, so that's in moderation. I exercise borderline too much. Uh, the only time I don't exercise is when I'm forced to rest. Like, like I had a little bit of the surgery, so I couldn't work out for about a week. Uh, if we're traveling and I miss, but even while we're traveling, there's gyms and hotels. I joined Planet Fitness just so I can work out when I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very, uh, very, very serious about health and fitness wealth um it it's relative uh you know it, it, it it's relative like I, I mentioned my mom she's probably as wealthy as anybody and not because she has a, a million dollars you know she just uh is happy with what she has good example uh I'll, you know i'm still striving i'm still trying to to, to build business and, and do better. And, and if I get lucky with the TV series, it'll put me on another level of wealth. Income producing assets. Oh, uh, you know, it, 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 like real estate, uh, you know, my wife and I have a rental property. Uh, it was her mother's house uh, that we bought for the mother, you know, and then she passed away. So now we rent it. Uh, I think that's, you know, probably a, a good thing to get into real estate. I would do that. Mm. Money. Yeah, really, that's it on that. You just, you know, I'm sorry. Money. The last one. Money, like we said before, it's really the root of all evil. Mm. Uh, if you get too greedy, money is... Uh, uh, Enough is enough. Mm. Enough is enough. Intellectual property. Uh, you know, I I had that first said to me, Armand Asante, he used those words. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, never be ashamed 
of your intellectual property and make sure it's not uh you get the proper value for it mm. yeah wow yeah family oh it's the most important thing mm. nothing more important all right that was good larry that was real good thank you can you explain to the audience one more time exactly where they can find you well, if you you could Google search me and probably spend a week reading different articles, uh, you know, the USA Today article comes up, the Mom Museum comes up, all the interviews. Now this great interview with you that I, I appreciate so much will come up. Uh, I, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, my website where the book is, is www.larrymazza-thelife.com. Mm. And... You know, uh, like I said, that's where you can get the hard copy. If you go to Amazon, you could get the Kindle version, but you don't get the pictures. You don't get it signed by me. Uh, like I said, I think that's a nice touch. People I see on Facebook, whenever somebody gets a book, it shows up on Facebook, with whatever I wrote for them. And typically it's a little different on all of them. Some of them, you know, it's hard to come up with something different, mm -hmm. a different way to say thank you and enjoy the book. I mean, you know, but I mm -hmm. date it now too. So, uh, but that's a good way. And Facebook, check me out on Facebook. I mean, I'm always, you know, uh, friending different people. I have, a, you know, I have, a, 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 what do you call it? A, I don't know if it's a blog or whatever, but it's called My Two Cents. Mm -hmm. And I get in, into some stuff, some, you know, uh, some political stuff when I hear it, uh, you know, uh, uh, some racial stuff when I hear it, different things, sports. And I have a, a, a little, you know, I think it's a funny way of saying what I think is the truth about things, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, you know, most people like it. Some people, I don't think I get any bad reviews unless they're just totally disagree with me, you mm -hmm. know, uh, on a certain political thing. Like, you know, you know, it could be, uh, let me, let me give you an example. Well, we'll just use the, the flag thing, taking a knee. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, there's two sides to that. There's two sides. I understand, you know, and I might have said in my thing, you know, I might have found a different way to make my point because why alienate the soldiers that fought for us of all colors, they're all races? Why mm -hmm. alienate them? You know, there's probably another way. You know, but he has the right to take an A. Mm. He has that right. So, <laughs> you know, but I try to give both sides and somewhere in there, I give my opinion of what I think, you know, but there's, there's a whole bunch. You, you know, when the Biden Trump thing was going on, mm -hmm. I mean, I had a ball with it because there was a lot of funny stuff. If you think mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of funny things between, you know, uh, Trump saying silly things and Biden's gaps and them two fighting. And I mean, it just, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of things that uh, I just enjoyed dissecting and mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. So anyway, I do it. It's called my two cents. Mm. Wow. So yes, find me uh, on Facebook. Okay. All right. To everyone that's listening, follow the phenomenal Larry Mazza. Now, you talked about your social media handles and, uh, you know, uh, Facebook owns Instagram. And uh, that's another platform where people are actually getting popular on their platform where they're publishing their content, where they're publishing their content on that platform. You mesmerizes the audience with your story. And uh, your book, which is called The Life, is uh, a fascinating uh, basic intellectual property that you published to the world about your life and actually what you went through with the Colombo Mafia family. Larry, can you explain to the audience in your own powerful way, what is the do's and don'ts of getting involved with the Mafia family and if people are actually thinking about going into that sector, what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, it's not uh, 
the families aren't what they once were. They've mm -hmm. been dismantled. It started with Rudy Giuliani, mm -hmm. uh, with the racketeering. Mm -hmm. It's been diluted. Uh, it's not old timers anymore. A lot of young blood coming up and doing things their own way. Mm -hmm. uh, there were rules, the do's and don'ts, you know, there were rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, I watched them all being broken. So they weren't true rules. They were just words like do as I say, not as I do. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's not what the movies portray it to be. You know, some of the movies are coming out now a little bit more realistic, uh, you know, uh, but like the, where they glorify it, like the Godfather, they glorified it. Uh, you know, some movies glorify it and it's, it's not true. It's a, the truth of the matter is you're selling your soul because you can't be an ethical person anymore. You mm -hmm. can't be an honorable person anymore. You can't be a truthful person anymore. You have to learn to lie. You have to be ready to stab in the back because you're going to get stabbed in the back. Uh, and you can probably make more money in the real world the right way. Mm. Because that's going to be short-lived anyway. You may have 10 years of making a lot of money, and you're going to go to jail for life. So who cares? Mm. Absolutely. You're better off. There's lots of there's lots of ways to earn a good living in this in this, especially in this country. Uh, pursue that. Go to school. Become a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant, or a fireman, a cop. Uh, well, business anything. Businessman. Exactly. There's lots. There's, there's lot. Oh, there's, right, right. Exactly. Uh, there's lots of ways to make a good living, and and it's and it's uh, like I said, you're not going to have to look over your shoulder and worry about the cops coming or an enemy coming to take it over. Uh, you know, and it's healthy. It's a nice, healthy lifestyle. Larry, let's have a dialogue about the true definition of an entrepreneur. Now, the word entrepreneur means entrepreneur. And it was a Latin word and it was invented in the 15th century in France. And the gentleman by the name of John Baptist, he invented the word and over 300 years later, that word still exists, which is entrepreneur. So entre mm -hmm. means between and pandre means to take. So it means to take lower productivity and increase it to higher productivity. Can you explain to the audience, how are you increasing your productivity in your gym business? Well, you just educated me I, on, on how that came about. I never really, I took it for granted what it meant, you know, just going out and uh, doing well in the business and, and then expanding it. Well, I started out as a personal trainer in another gym. Mm. I built up a good enough clientele mm. and uh, students in the martial arts that I did the math. I says, I'm getting X amount here. If I opened up a small place of my own, less the rent, I'll double my income. Mm. I did that as I kept growing and bringing in more trainers in. And I give the trainers a very, very fair, very fair deal. Uh, I don't take any of their earnings. I just want the membership. So mm -hmm. they bring their client in, they join the gym and they could charge whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So that brought my membership rate much higher. Mm -hmm. So you always, you use the word before implement, you're always implementing something. I have a backyard in my gym where it's on uh, a piece of the river mm -hmm. and there's palm trees. It's a beautiful, beautiful out there. You know, sometimes it's too hot, but I set up uh, an obstacle course or a survival course or a boot camp, whatever you want to call it, where there's a wall to jump over, there's tires to flip, there's jump ropes, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of different things to do. And I had weights out there. And if you go around that circuit two or three times, It'll take you probably a 30, 40 minutes. You're getting a full body workout. People love it. It's outdoor. Most of the other gyms don't have an outdoor spot. So I utilize that. You know, uh, I take, I have running classes. We have uh, uh, along the river, there's a causeway. Mm -hmm. So we, we walk to the bottom of the causeway, which is probably half a mile. Mm -hmm. We jog up the causeway because we're running uphill. Mm -hmm. it's a bridge we get to the top of the bridge everybody does push-ups some sit-ups you know or crunches we walk back down we run up again we do that like 10 times 
and it's a serious workout, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to just keep improvising uh, where it doesn't get boring. Uh, you know, uh, marketing is important. You have to be able to, you know, but I'm in a town where I've gotten so well known because I worked at all the different gyms. I've had, I have, you know, uh, local judges, lawyers, real, real estate. I uh, have a family that the father was a surgeon, the son's a surgeon. There's four mm -hmm. daughters that are neat, uh, nurses. The mm -hmm. mom was a nurse. They all come to me. I get to the point where I tell them, why are you still coming? You, you know your routine. Why are you still paying me? They tell me, if you weren't here, I wouldn't be here. So that's a nice thing to hear, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, and, and um, so building that and constantly staying on top of that. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, like I said, we have the one rental property. We're starting to think about possibly getting a second one, you know. Uh, but that's really it. But, you know, we use a lot of the words perseverance and persistence you got to just keep on doing it and, and good comes good comes out of it if you keep trying mm, absolutely yeah. larry i appreciate you coming on my show today because the whole premise right. of my show is to educate entrepreneurs and business owners on a local national international level that they can live the life that they truly desire but they have to be open right. to these important principles so i don't like what i see what's on the news so i create my own news that's a great thing to do. And I thank you for having me. And I'll come back. Maybe we'll do another one down the road, part two. Yes, yes. Let's do There's another one down the road, part two, with uh, the phenomenal Larry Mazza. And uh, that would be a great duel with uh, Robert De Niro being on the platform. Oh, wow. That would be something. But we'll see, you know, uh, there's others too. Like I said, I'm on the Sante, Michael Madsen, all good, very dear friends. And, you know, De Niro is so so busy and so up there mm -hmm. uh but Armand and Mike Madsen are buddies I mean they become friends and they'll call me back like that you know sometimes De Niro don't call me back for a week or two and mm -hmm. I haven't heard from him in quite some time now because you know between hiding out for COVID and not working and the problems of the world mm -hmm. just you know but uh but yeah that'd be that'd be great and even Craig DeFrancia I do I do my fellow hitman from the Green Book watch the Green Book Mm. next time i come on i want to talk about that okay absolutely yeah, absolutely because i know yeah. know a lot of the people in that movie now so okay. uh, do you have any last like, pearls of wisdom for the audience well you know uh you you are a great host you 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 asked some brilliant questions you you put out those words you caught me a little off guard i hope uh, uh my answers were you know enlightening to some to some extent mm -hmm. uh but pretty much what we said you know i've been uh you know, i don't say rags to riches but i was uh in the light went into the dark world and came back to the light so you know uh just never give up and stay positive and uh and try just keep trying hard at whatever you're doing mm. and it'll pay off Larry, you're a blessing from God. Well, thank you so much. To everyone that's listening and watching right now, I highly recommend get involved with the phenomenal Larry Mazza and go to his website and make the initial investment and invest in his book. His book is called The Life. A Brooklyn Boy is Seduced into the Dark World of the Mafia. This is a fascinating book. Well, thank and, you very uh, much. They're working on a TV series for his book. And I know it's going to be on, you know, all the powerful distribution platforms like Netflix, Amazon. Um, make the initial investment and go to his website. He has phenomenal content that could take your mindset and also your business to a whole nother level. But remember, you have to implement what you learn. And just Google his name, Larry Mazza, L-A-R-R-Y-M-A-Z-Z-A. And his content, along with his book, is just going to pop up. And he's been on other platforms as well. And he has a fascinating, powerful life lessons on what he's learned as being in the Colombo Mafia family. So to everyone that's listening and watching right now, remember that the strongest asset that each and every one of you have is your brain and what you think about and what you take action on 
that will become your reality and your mentality creates your reality. May God bless each and every one of you and bye for now. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate you coming on my platform today. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming back. Thank you. Have a pleasant day, everyone.